67th Company was in even worse shape. They lost their company commander and four of their five lieutenants and their first sergeant. And one of the few guys still on his feet is this guy, Gunnery Sergeant Ernst Jansen. Uh, now Jansen, um, well, I'll, I'll read from his Medal of Honor citation because it's pretty incredible. Um, immediately after the company had reached its objective on Hill 142, several hostile counterattacks were launched against the line before the new position had been consolidated. Gunnery Sergeant Jansen was attempting to organize a position on the north slope of the hill when he saw 12 of the enemy armed with five light machine guns crawling toward his group. Now think about this, you're a gunnery sergeant, you're trying to consolidate your defensive position, you see 12 Germans with five machine guns out there in front of you, what do you do? I don't know what I'd do. I, today I'd want to call in mortars or throw in rifle grenades at them or something like that. Given the alarm, Gunnery Sergeant Jansen rushed the hostile detachment bayoneted the two leaders and forced the others to flee, abandoning their machine guns. Uh, so, I think he deserved Mel Okay, so now Hill 142 is secure. So Hill 142 was, was way off the map over here. So now the left flank of the brigade is secure. And now the Marine Corps thinks it's going to attack and clear Bella Wood in one day on June 6, 1918. And this becomes the costliest day in Marine Corps history up to that point. The Marine Corps suffers more casualties on this day than in all of its 175 year history prior to this. Um, so 3-5 is going to attack from west to east. They're supposed to clear the northern half of Bella Wood. 3-6 is going to attack from the vicinity of this town of Lucy, clear the southern half of Bella Wood, and once Bella Wood is secure, they're going to seize the town of Baresh. The second battalion, six Marines, is just going to move in a pinwheel alongside three six, just to keep the line straight. Make sense? So that's that's the basically the plan of attack. But the Marines don't have good maps. They don't have a good understanding of how many Germans are in Bella Wood. There's actually as many Germans in Bella Wood as there are Marines attacking it, which is not really what you're going for. Um, and so their artillery, although there's a lot of artillery support, a whole brigade. They don't really know where to shoot, and we're not using the rolling barrage for, for various reasons. So it becomes a very uh, costly attack. And here's another aspect that I think is significant. So the guy in the upper left-hand corner, that's the French Corps commander. That's the division commander, Omar Bundy. The brigade commander, John Harbour. The 6th Marines commander who's in charge of this attack. Uh, his name's Albertus Catlin. One of the battalion commanders is Thomas Holcomb, 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines. His 96th Company commander, who's his main effort, is Donald Duncan, and one of his platoon commanders, a guy named Clifton Case. Okay, so De Gaulle gives his order at 1500 June 5, which is past the harbor the evening of June 5. He doesn't issue his order until 1405 on June 6, and because it has to be delivered by motorcycle messenger, doesn't get to Catlin until 1545. Catlin issues a verbal order to Holcomb at 1600, who issues a verbal order to Duncan at 1630, who gives Cates his verbal order at 1645, which Cates characterizes as very sketchy. Because they had a mile to run to get to their tongue, uh, attack position, and they had 15 minutes to get there. This is what 3-5 was looking at when they did their attack uh, on the afternoon of June 6. Um, one of their sergeants, Merwin Silverthorne, uh, he's another wartime volunteer, um, said, we started off in trench warfare formation, the only formation we knew. We moved toward Bella Woods, which we could see at this high point, nobody firing a shot, bayonets fixed, moving at slow, steady cadence that we've been taught to move, because theoretically, a barrage is shooting in front of you and you don't want to walk too fast, or, or you'll walk into your own barrage. Bella Woods was teeming with machine guns. I mean, it seemed that way, and nobody was firing a shot at these Germans. They had us enfiladed. The lieutenant and I stopped halfway across the roof this ravine behind some cordwood to get our bearings. The lieutenant looked around and said, well, where the hell is my platoon? Well, his platoon was mostly killed and wounded. There were six of us. Uh, Sergeant Silverthorne uh, proceeded forward from that point and was shot very quickly thereafter in the knee. Um, he left the dressing station in Lucy to find a wounded friend later on that evening uh, who had passed away. But Silverthorne would stay with the Marine Brigade the rest of the war. There was another guy in the attack, an embedded reporter. They used to dress in uniform back then, so he's in an army uniform. His name's Floyd Gibbon. He's a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and the wounds that he's got bandaged here in this photograph, he's lost an eye and he's lost part of his arm. Uh, he was actually with the battalion commander when he got wounded. 
Uh, his friends back at the Associated Press thought he was going to die, so his last dispatch didn't go through the normal censorship channels that it would. So this was the headline America woke up to uh, the next day. As U.S. Marine Smash Hunts, great headline, great story by Floyd Gibbons. Gives the Marine Corps a lot of publicity um, and created a lot of jealousy between the Army and the Marines because Army units could not be identified uh, by their number. So it wouldn't say 2nd Division is doing a great job. It would just say U.S. Army and U.S. American Expeditionary Force in action. So um, uh, there was a lot of jealousy between Army and Marine officers over the well, what the Army officers probably rightly thought was a little bit of undue publicity the Marine Corps got during World War I. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to talk about the 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines attack, because I know a lot more about this. I haven't written a book about it. So this is what Donald Duncan's 96th Company saw uh, after they ran that mile uh, in 15 minutes to go into the attack position. So he's leading the company in attack formation across this open ground. Uh, the, the witnesses said it looked as, uh, as perfect as, as if they were marching on a parade. And when they got about 600 meters from the town, the Germans opened up with protective artillery barrages and probably eight to 10 machine guns shooting at them from the buildings of Buresh and maybe uh, the heights in Bella Wood to their left. And you had these two guys, among many others, distinguish themselves. So Donald Duncan, the company commander, takes a machine gun burst to the belly and is killed instantly. His uh, second in command is the guy on the right, a Mustang officer named James Robertson, first lieutenant. Uh, and after the whole company is pinned down, lying in the open, suffering casualties, uh, HE rounds going off all around them, loud noise, confusion, fear, Robertson stands up, walks in front of the 4th platoon on the left-hand side of the company, waves his 45 and says, come on, let's go. And he leads the company in a charge toward the town directly through the German protective artillery barrage. Uh, an incredibly brave thing to do. Robertson's uh, appropriately awarded uh, the Navy Cross for what he does this day. Robertson didn't even know that 2-6 wasn't supposed to take the town, that 3-6 was supposed to take the town. He just knew that they were in a firefight, his company commander was dead, they were pinned in the open, and the town was right in front of it and it seemed to be a problem. So he exercises initiative uh, not consistent with the training that the Marine Corps had been giving him um, and gets to the town with about 24 guys is all. One of the reasons they're able to make it into the town, the guy in the lower left-hand corner is an automatic rifleman uh, named James McClellan. He's a sergeant in the 79th company. Um, and he actually is following in support. He's the second line company. Uh, he's following in support behind Robertson. He works his way up to the front line and suppresses some of these German machine guns before they pull back, helping Robertson and his guys get into the town. When they get into the town, um, this guy, Lieutenant Clifton B. Cates, makes his way up through a ravine and rejoins them. And the 24 Marines are from his platoon, so Robertson puts him in charge and goes back to get the rest of the company up into the town. Uh, I'm sorry, his picture didn't come up there. There he is, Cliff Cates. So Cliff Cates, second lieutenant, University of Tennessee grad, one of these wartime officer recruits. Uh, and he proceeds to start clearing the Germans out of the town. Fortunately for the Americans, this is really an outpost and the Germans have pulled back voluntarily under the pressure. Um, so he sets up uh, a quick defense. One of his privates, a guy named Herbert Dunleavy, uh, takes out a German machine gunner who's up in the church steeple with one rifle shot uh, and then turns the German machine gun on the, on the German machine gunner. So both these guys are awarded Navy crosses for their actions that day, clearing the town of Buresh. Buresh is very important because although the attack on Bella Wood is disaster, 3-5 is repulsed, only one of its companies even gets into the woods, and 3-6 is struggling in the southern part of the woods and has not been able to break into the German mainline resistance, we now have Buresh, and Buresh is a strong point on the southeast tip of Bella Wood, and it enables the Marines to continue to start grinding their way through Bella Wood with their right and the left flank secure with Hill 142 and the right flank secure with the town of Buresh. The Marines have suffered a lot of losses, so they start to get replacements. Uh, replacement battalions were a thousand strong, as big as an infantry battalion, with basically one of everybody in the battalion. They get to the front. Uh, the Marines are so badly hurt and they have no withdrawn, they're actually feeding replacements right into the front line companies and points. Uh, the guy on the left, that's John Thomason, he actually shows up on June the 7th as a replacement officer. The guy in the middle is Carl Brannan. He's a private. He's a private, but he had, and this is his uniform, he's a cadet at Texas A&M. Gives you an idea of the quality of people the Marine Corps is enlisting as privates. Carl Brannan could have been an officer in the Army if he had wanted to, but he'd rather be a private in the Marines. Um, 
I agree with that. And then Elton Mackin on the right hand side, he's from Buffalo, New York. Uh, he's a replacement, goes up into uh, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. Uh, interestingly, all three of these guys wrote uh, excellent memoirs at their time in Bellawood. And then it becomes a series of grinding attacks. I'm not going to give you the big blue arrow, but the Marines thought they were going to clear Bellawood on June 6th, and it actually takes them um, uh, 19 more days to clear Bellawood. Uh, one six attacks from the south on June the 10th with a very, very, very well-supported artillery barrage, but because they don't know where the Germans are, because the maps are so bad, because land navigation, honestly, is not a, a core skill of a lot of Marine officers during this period, uh, the artillery barrage is largely ineffective. One six is unable to breach the German line. Two five attacks from the west on June 11, fights its way all the way through the woods, does an excellent job under a battalion commander named Fritz Wise, but he's disoriented, he's not very good at land nav, he's on the east side of the woods, this is 2-5 after the attack. He's on the east side of the woods. He thinks that he's on the north side of the woods. He's looking at the town of Beresh and the town of Bello up here. And he thinks he's looking at Bello and the town of Torsi there. Um, and so this allows Germans to infiltrate behind him. And there's a confused amount of fighting over the next couple of days until finally the lines consolidated here uh, about June 12th. All right. There's a series of more attacks. Uh, Marines get um, bogged down, they're getting whittled away for a long period. And I'm going to start to talk more about the human side of the battle. Um, this guy here is a sergeant in 1-6 named Gerald Thomas. He's actually, you guys will love this, he's the battalion intel chief. Um, and he's also a wartime volunteer, just a sergeant already. Uh, and he and the battalion intelligence officer are trying to figure out where 2-5's flank is uh, in relation to 1-6's line and they come across one of these pockets of Germans that's actually behind 2-5's line. So they get a scratch squad together with some 2-5 Marines uh, and lead an attack. This is a battalion intel officer, battalion intel chief, leading a, a squad of riflemen from another battalion in an attack and take out a German position. Um, so Thomas is awarded the Silver Star for his valor there. Um, and then the battle just starts to grind away. On the night of June 13 and 14 in the reserve position, uh, two companies of 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines are getting ready to move up and relieve 2-5. And they get hit by what the Germans called a drenching bombardment. Now, Marines had encountered chemical warfare before, but generally what happened is you get hit with a few gas shells and you just put your gas mask on, you move out of the way, and you clean up, and then you go on about your business. It was more or less a nuisance. But the Germans have been able, since the lines have uh, sort of solidified and become stable and not mobile, they've been able to build up how much artillery and chemical weapons ammunition they have. And when they see this lucrative target of two marine rifle companies in the small woods, is they hit them at about midnight with a really, really heavy HE bombardment, which pins the Marines in their position. So they all scurry into their holes and then they start hitting them with gas. So they all put on their gas masks, but they can't move and they can't see. And back then in a gas mask, it basically had like a clothespin to pinch your nose shut, and you had to put a rubber tube inside your mouth, so you couldn't, you couldn't really talk to each other, and the lenses weren't that great, so you couldn't really see. So these Marines are just in their holes, and their mustard gas is seeping through their clothing for hours, and they can't move. This, this was an unprecedented attack for the Marines. They had never experienced anything like this. It destroyed these two companies of 2-6, and also hit 1-6, 2-6 ends up taking 378 casualties, and they're not even in the front line. 1-6 in the same period takes 185 casualties from the same. And you have guys like this. Here's one of the old leathernecks, Gunnery Sergeant Fred Stockham. He had fought in Nicaragua. He'd gotten out for a while. He was a firefighter in Newark, New Jersey, and came back in. He was actually a recruiter in St. Louis, Missouri. One of the guys that enlisted while he was a recruiter there in St. Louis, Missouri, was a young private named Barrett Mattingly. And Barrett Mattingly is in Stockholm's platoon. And an HE round goes off, knocks Mattingly, he's wounded. Stockholm runs over, puts him in a fireman's carry, starts taking the aid station. Another HE round goes off, knocks both of them to the deck. When Stockholm finds Mattingly, he finds not only is Mattingly wounded, but his gas mask has been destroyed. So unhesitatingly, Stockholm takes off his own mask, puts it on his Marine puts him back in a fireman's carry, takes him to the aid station, comes back and evacuates two more evac uh, Marines before he collapses. Now, we've all read uh, and been inspired by Marines in, in the Pacific in World War II who threw themselves on grenades to save their buddies. And that's an incredible act of selfless valor. 
Um, but at least if you did that, it'd all be over in a second, right? Stockholm suffers and drowns in his own lung fluid for three days before he finally has a merciful death at the aid station. That's an incredible act of valor. Uh, obviously something that should inspire all of us, I think, to uh, try and live up to his legacy. And now I'm just going to talk basically about what, how bad was it? I mean, what was the suck factor at Bellawood? The suck factor was really bad. Uh, you had guys like Levi Hammer who wrote an outstanding memoir of the war. He said, we were covered with body lice, hungry and thirsty. We were bruised in body and soul, tired and weary, dirty and weakened by dysentery, that lousy, messy sun kind that requires lots of paper and sanitation, but we had none. There was human blood on our hands that went for days uh, without being washed. Um, the medical injuries were horrible. A uh, battalion surgeon uh, wrote in his official report, the character of the wounds encountered here fall chiefly to the terror, lacerating, crushing, and amputating types accompanied by all degrees of fractures, hemorrhage, and destruction of soft tissue. And then you had the mental injuries. Okay, this guy, Sergeant Romain P. Benjamin, another wartime volunteer, said a high explosive burst near me and my nerves went stabbed. I could, I shook, and I couldn't stop. I was ordered to leave the wood this morning. The trip back through the wood to Lucy was a nightmare. The dead, mainly German, lay in the heaps. A shell struck a pile of bodies, and one hurling through the air struck me and threw me down. I crossed a great open field, always under the fire, arrived in Lucy at the Red Cross station, almost crazy, and the doctors tagged me, gas, and shell shock. Um, obviously, there was effects on the mind that they experienced then, just like we're uh, dealing with today, right? Uh, incredibly, though, Sergeant Benjamin spent about two hours in that aid station, ripped off his casualty tag, and went back to his company in Bellwood and spent the rest of the battle with them. Finally, uh, on June 23, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines launches uh, another attack, which fails to drive the Germans out of the northern end of Bellwood, but there's only about 600 square meters of Germans. So finally, on June 25, the 2nd Division pummels that 600 square meter foothold of Germans on the northern tip of Bellawood, about where the cemetery is today, for 14 hours. And after 14 hours, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines goes over the top and is able to clear the Germans out, captures most of them. Most of the Germans aren't ready to put up much of a fight. In fact, this guy, um, I think the story is true because I've read it from a, a couple of different sources. But this is Private Henry P. Leonard. He's a um, private company runner in 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. He gets lost during this attack, and he gets taken prisoner for a short period by the Germans. And the German officer, probably a company commander, battalion commander, is interrogating him, and Leonard tells him, well, you're surrounded by the 5th Marines, and the 6th Marines are right behind them. So the German says, very well, the situation's impossible. I offer you my surrender. And the German officer surrenders himself, three other officers and 79 soldiers, to Private Leonard, uh, who then walks them back to the 2nd Division and Key Casualty Collection Point. And he even got a silver star for it, so it must be true, right? Um, so finally, Major Shearer, the CO35, is able to send a field message back to the brigade commander. Bella Woods is now U.S. Marine Corps entirely. Uh, but the battle's not over because the Marines need to hold Bella Woods. So 2nd Battalion, 6th Marines is coming up um, on the night of June 25 to relieve 3-5. Um, and as a column from the 79th Company hits Bella Wood, right where I've put this little marker here, they're, gonna, they're trying to get up to the northern end where 3-5 is and relieve them. It's a night time, and they've got a column of twos, and when they hit the tree line, you know, the column starts to bunch up. And right when they start to bunch up, they get hit by another one of these drenching bombardments like had taken out the 78th and 96th companies a few nights before. And the company commander is killed. And everybody goes to ground, and it's dark, and they're putting their gas masks on, and they can't see, and they don't have any holes to crawl into. Uh, and it's a very bad situation. It looks like the 79th company is going to be destroyed. Um, the first sergeant is a guy named um, Simon Barber. Uh, give you an idea of what the Marine Corps is doing manpower-wise. He's been in the Marine Corps 18 months. He's the company first sergeant. Um, he loses both his legs uh, and eventually dies. The company commander's dead. And this guy down here is a gunnery sergeant. He's one of the old leathernecks, gunnery sergeant Bernard Fritz. He had been the first sergeant um, originally, but he and the company commander had a falling out. So 
it was a temporary rank, so he was uh, now reverted to his permanent rank of gunnery sergeant. So he's a platoon sergeant, but now he's acting first sergeant again because Barber's gone, right? And he walks up to the guy in the upper right-hand corner, a Louisiana State University grad named uh, Graves B. Erskine. Uh, and according to Erskine's account, Fritz stands at full attention in the middle of this German bombardment, salutes Lieutenant Erskine and says, Sir, you are in command. What are your orders? And uh, Erskine's kind of startled by this, but he gets Fritz to take cover for a few moments until there's a, a gap in the bombardment. Then he and Fritz get the company on their feet and get them moving again up the road to get out of the impact area. In the meantime, the guy in the lower right-hand corner, uh, a lieutenant named Jack West, realized that, hey, we don't know where we're going now. So he runs up that road with a couple of his guys, finds 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, finds a company commander they're supposed to relieve, and gets guides, and runs back down the road, uh, and finds Erskine and Barber leading the company up. And they're actually able to affect the relief of 3-5, the company they're supposed to relieve in 3-5, and they only lost 16 casualties that night, which was uh, pretty lucky, fortunate, but also due to the leadership of guys like uh, Fritz and Erskine and West. So what was the toll? For the entire Battle of Bella Wood, the 4th Marine Brigade lost almost 4,300 casualties. Now that's out of an original strength of just over 8,000. Uh, there was a lot of replacements thrown in there. And this is what World War I looks like for the 4th Brigade going forward. This is, think about it, this is one six month deployment. So 3,600 wounded, 665 killed. At Bella Wood, at Soissons, 1,632 and 200. Samuel, 613 and 81 killed. Blank Mont, 2016 wounded, 292 killed. And finally in the Argonne, 1,233 wounded and 185 killed. Another way to look at it though is if we take the initial strength of the 4th Brigade, 8,118, if they had never received a single replacement and they had never had any of their wounded guys come back from the aid stations, they would have been down minus 2,432 after a little over five months of combat. That's a lot of losses for any organization in any war. So what do they have to do? What's the Marine Corps got to do as an institution? You know, aside from the mental wear and tear that this is putting on people and the physical losses, they have to fill their gaps. I'll tell you one thing they do, and it's pretty innovative and it's pretty bold, and I don't know if the Marine Corps would do it today. Marine Corps Order Number 25, which was issued by the Commandant in 1917, before the Marine Corps even went into combat, no further appointments of civilians to the rank of second lieutenant. All vacancies will be filled by meritorious promotion of non-commissioned officers. 164 second lieutenants were appointed from the ranks in the 4th Marine Brigade. The 4th Marine Brigade only rates 154 second lieutenants. So that gives you an idea. They filled all of their vacant platoons with meritorious promotion of non-commissioned officers. And a lot of these NCOs that they're promoting some of them were staff NCOs, like the guy on the right, Gunnery Sergeant Fritz gets promoted at the end of Bella Wood, the second lieutenant. Uh, he loses his hand at Soissons the next month and is mentally retired. Uh, the guy on the left, though, that's that machine gun squad leader that was at Le Marais Farm, okay, John Winford. He's a second lieutenant by the end of the war. He's a wartime volunteer, been in the Marine Corps 18 months. They also had to do this. So this is a second division memo. It came out after Samuel, but they actually had done it for Samuel, too. It says, until further orders, the following instructions will govern in the 2nd Division. Upon going into action, 20% of the authorized strength of each infantry regiment and machine gun battalion will be left out of the attack. So what they're saying is, we think our losses are going to be so bad that we need a 20% cadre just to rebuild the companies and battalions around when we go back in after this action, because it's a long war. We're going to have to do this again and again and again and again. And as Carl Brandon said, when he was not left out of the Blank Mont fight, and he looked up at the hill of Blank Mont, he said, yep, I figured that um, I was going to be one of those Marines guarding heaven's seas before this war ended. The Marine Corps also adapts. Unfortunately for the 2nd Division, they get a new division commander, uh, John A. Lejeune. Most of you have heard of him. Uh, he's a Marine general, but he has such a good reputation both in the Marine Corps and in the U.S. Army uh, that the Army gives him command of their 2nd Division. Um, and he's able to take the division through a period of retra retraining after the Battle of Soissons before the Battle of Saint-Miel. He has about a month there in August. Uh, and what he tells them, 
is he wants you to require your subordinates to dispose their troops in accordance with the situation, discuss the exercise with officers and non-commissioned officers with a view to developing best methods. The adoption of normal methods of attack or defense which limit the use of troops to fixed formations is prohibited. So Lejeune gets it. Remember this guy, Harry Lee, who was all about musketry and mechanical warfare and precision and drill and all that stuff? Okay, even he, he's now the regimental commander for six Marines because they lost theirs in Bella Wood. Catlin got wounded. He's now the CEO of six Marines. After Blank Mont, he says, experience has taught us that pure infantry against wonderfully prepared machine gun positions, such as we've encountered, is too costly in casualties. A thorough shaking of the morale of the defenders by harassing fire and heavy bombardment directed at the next nest area is the best and cheapest means of reducing their capture. So the Marine Corps is learning, painfully. Marine Corps officers are learning. Uh, at the cost of a lot of casualties, but they know what they're doing by the end of the war. Other things, uh, innovations that you see by the end of the war that are making things go a lot more smoothly. Uh, they've got tank support, they're using rolling barrages effectively. Artillery liaison is done down to the battalion level. Um, they're using scouts and aggressive patrolling to collect intelligence before they go into action. They're in, uh, integrating aerial reconnaissance, taking pictures of German positions before uh, they go over. Uh, and staff works improved immensely. Uh, they also have another innovation, which is not so good. It's called marching fire. Can I see the O3 again? teaching Marines to do this. They'd all be online, advancing behind the rolling barrage and shooting from the hip with both action rifles as they move through the objective. Not a very good technique, but it's what they were taught. They were trying to do something that would suppress German machine guns, and they really didn't have anything. And then, of course, the ugly was the 20% cadre that they had to leave behind. But these are the ways the second division and the fourth marine brigade are adapting to the western front to the problems they've seen and there's also the legacy of the fourth marine brigade and i'm going to go through a couple examples so remember this sergeant merwin silverthorne wartime volunteer sergeant 35 gets wounded in the knee on june 6th he's um uh he fights in haiti in the 1920s he's the chief of staff for the third marine amphibious corps in the pacific and he's the uh acmac the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps during the 1950s. He retires right here as the CG of Marine Corps Recruit Depot uh, in 1954. Gerald C. Thomas, the intel chief for 1-6, is a sergeant. He's the CG of 1st Marine Division in Korea. He's the, uh, the, ops, the assistant ops of for 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal. And uh, he retires as the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps in uh, 1954. Uh, this guy here, Cliff Cates, Cliff Cates um, went on to be the CEO of 1st Marines on Guadalcanal, the CG of the 4th Marine Division on Iwo Jima, and Commandant of the Marine Corps from 1948 to 51. Uh, did you guys get to see him? I'm sorry. There he is. Commandant of the Marine Corps in the early 50s. And then Bill Erskine, uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, Lemuel Shepard, uh, who was uh, wounded in the neck, refused to be evacuated. He's CG of the 6th Marine Division on Okinawa, and he's coming on the Marine Corps after Case. And then this guy, Bill Erskine, the one that Gunnery Sergeant Fritz went up to and asked him, Sir, you're in command. What are your orders? Uh, he's CG of 3rd Marine Division on Iwo Jima. And then he's also Commanding General of Fleet Marine Force Atlantic. Before he retires, goes on to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations for eight years during the Eisenhower administration. Um, so when these guys look back at us across 100 years and say, well, what do we learn? Why does Bella Wood still mean to us today? I would ask you to think about it. What does Bella Wood mean to you today? And I'll tell you some of the lessons, the practical lessons that I take away that I think are meaningful for the Marine Corps today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have to go into combat expecting to adapt. Whatever we've been taught as our standard operating procedures and our techniques, tactics, and procedures, we have to expect that we're going to adapt it to the new warfare, because the war we're going into is not going to be like the war we just fought. 
Second, in order to adapt, we need to develop proper problem solvers, not machines. Absolutely, when we graduate from recruit training, what we want a Marine to be able to do is, is an instant and willing obedience to orders and to be able to shoot, okay? But we then need to develop problem solvers to adapt to that conflict we're going into. How much firepower is enough? It's not an easy question to answer. It normally comes from experience and costly losses, but we have to understand how much and the, what type of firepower is actually going to enable you to maneuver against the enemy. Gas and bugs. I didn't talk too much about the influenza uh, epidemic, but I talked about the chemical warfare attacks that absolutely devastated a couple of battalions from the 6th Marines at Bella Woods. Later in the war, the entire 4th Brigade and most of the American armies brought to its knees by the 1918 influenza epidemic. These are paradigm shifts, a new form of threat that we're not used to dealing with. And it's those types of things that can make your unit combat ineffective. Okay, you're going to be resilient to be able to overcome the war you prepared for, but maybe not the threat that you never even thought about coming. The legacy, guys like Gerald Thomas and Clifton Cates and Bill Erskine, all those guys that were running our Marine Corps in the 1950s and winning the war in the Pacific in the 1940s, these guys were just wartime recruits, privates uh, and second lieutenants coming in off the street. Okay, so when you're recruiting somebody, you're not recruiting somebody to be a private. You're not recruiting an officer to be a second lieutenant. You're recruiting somebody because somebody you recruit this year is going to be running your organization in 25 years. Sacred manpower cops. Okay, they did some things in World War I that I don't know that the Marine Corps could handle today. I can tell you being a regimental exo in 2003, uh, it seemed like we and manpower were on opposite sides of a battle. Uh, in order, like we had company commanders aboard ship on their way to Iraq being told to go to security forces because that was more critical. Um, so manpower cows uh, that, we, that are fair and appropriate for peacetime may not be fair and appropriate in wartime. And then last, I think the most enduring lesson is that well-led Marines can endure a heck of a lot more than maybe, maybe we give them credit for. The beauty of the Champagne today is beguiling. By the end of June in 1918, this most beautiful of places was then the most miserable of places. Shells and shovels had scarred the landscape around Bella Wood. Blast and fragment had peeled trees to their trunks. Homes lay in rubble. The stink of death, of gas, and of human waste choked the air. It may seem audacious for us to try and capture the savagery of this battle through this short presentation. It's one thing for us to assess the actions of the Marines in 1918 with our maps and our arrows and our archives, and it was quite another for them to think clearly amidst the unrelenting noise of combat after weeks of sleepless nights and short rations while assailed from every quarter by horror and filth and fear. About 10 years after the war, one of these guys I talked about, Jack West, uh, he had been a football player, All-American for the University of Michigan, as well as wartime second lieutenants. Uh, he's gotten out of the Marine Corps. And he's, an insurance salesman, I think. Uh, he went back to Bella Wood 10 years later. Uh, it wasn't nice and pristine like it is today, but uh, the people there had started to recover. And he just wanted to reconnect with what he had gone through at that time. He was actually, by the way, he was nominated for the Medal of Honor for a leading a company at Blanc Mon. It was downgraded to a Navy Cross. Um, he was severely wounded in that fight. And I talked to his son. His son said, he, I think my dad had what we call today post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, uh, he suffered a lot his whole life but he went back there and he wrote about a 10 page narrative of his walk around the battlefield in 1927 uh, but really what he was doing was reliving what he had done in each one of these locations what he had seen and observed it's pretty grim uh, it hasn't been published I, I use it a lot in my book um, and um, it, it's, per it's pretty graphic uh, and at the end of it he said something I think that's really profound he said after Bella Wood war for us became largely a business Men, just numbers, changing constantly. But here, men were living things, personalities, friends, and here many of those friends gave all they had. So what we got next? Okay, so I know some of you, uh, like Colonel Russo, have, have visited the battlefield, and some of you are thinking, oh, I would really like to do that sometime. If you find yourself in the vicinity of Paris sometime, it's not hard to get to, and it's worth the trip. I've even done it from a... Uh, from Toulon when I was on med float. Uh, I don't recommend you try and do that in two days like we did. It was a little, it was a little ambitious. Um, but if you do go, uh, a couple of hints for you. First off, 
Um, the Marine Corps History Division is putting out the book on the left. It's free electronically or in hard copy called Bravest Deeds of Men. It's written by Colonel Bill Anderson, who's led a lot of tours there. Uh, it's excellent. The maps are amazing. Uh, I used some of them in the presentation today. So get yourself a copy of that. You don't even need it. I mean, it's worth a read, even if you're not going to be able to get there. Uh, but get a hold of that. But also, if you're going to go to the expense and the time to go visit Bella Wood, get yourself a guide. And the best is this man, Gilles Lejeune, the guy holding the gas mask. So Gilles is one of the few civilians who've been given the title Honorary Marine. Uh, he has been leading Marines uh, on tours of Bella Wood for decades, knows more about the battle, hands down, than anybody else on the face of the planet. I can't guarantee that he will find you a gas mask while you're out there, uh, but you'll definitely find some shrapnel, and more importantly, you'll find out a lot about the battle you can't get from reading. But you do want to read before you go. Um, very briefly, here's some of the best books uh, that I would recommend. Uh, the one in the upper left-hand corner is George Clark's Devil Dogs, History of the Marine Corps of World War I. Uh, George researched the Marine Corps his entire life, uh, and everybody who writes a decent book about the Marine Corps of World War I is drawing on his work. One of his other best books is Devil Dogs Chronicle. It's a bunch of first-person vignettes by corporals and sergeants and privates and lieutenants that it describe all the actions of the Marine Corps of World War I. It's, it's well worth picking up a copy. This book just came out. Kevin Selden's a, a former Marine sergeant, uh, and he's writing a three-volume history of the Battle of Bella Wood. That's a lot of reading, but it's excellent. Uh, I'm relearning and learning new stuff as I'm working my way through his first volume right now. So volume one's out, volume two and three will be out uh, hopefully soon. Uh, Suddenly We Didn't Want to Die is the best first person memoir I've ever read from the First World War. It compares very favorably to um, With the Old Breed at Peleliu and Okinawa by E.B. Sledge. Uh, very grim. Mackin's the guy from Buffalo, New York. He got a Navy Cross during the war. He was in 1-5. Robert Asprey, a uh, former Marine himself, wrote a history of the battle about 50 years ago called At Bella Wood. It's very good, very well done. Uh, Don Paradis' memoir, uh, he was a private from Detroit at the beginning of the war. He was actually a gunnery sergeant right after the armistice. Um, he wrote an excellent memoir, and all the royalties from that book go to the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation. It's a good read. Uh, it's real easy. Through the week, uh, General Simmons, who used to run the History Division, and Colonel Alexander, who's a famous Marine historian, wrote an excellent history of the Marine Corps in the First World War. It's a good book. And then there's my book. It's outstanding. Uh, all right. And I know I've been going on and on and on and on. Um, did okay on time? Okay. All right, good. All right, so uh, I'm going to stay here and answer questions as long as you keep asking. And then I'll stay here and answer more questions after everybody goes if you got something that you're too embarrassed or shy or cowardly to answer, ask in front of the group. Yes, sir. I've, uh, in one of the accounts that I've read of uh, Hello Wood, it, uh, it mentioned an incident that I haven't found corresponding uh, substantiation, and that's in taking Hill 142. There were three Marines who actually overshot the mark and made it all the way to Torse, and they engaged a company or battalion of Germans that was uh, preparing a counterattack. Um, one of the Marines got wounded and was sent back with the word, uh, tell the lieutenant to take the Torse. Yep. Uh, I believe that's true. Um, one of my friends, I don't know if it was Gilles or another guy named Alan Romolo, um, found a dog tag from a Marine from 1-5 in Torsi. Um, so that's, and, and I think it corresponded to one of the two missing Marines from that. Uh, I, but there's lots of, not authoritative, but compelling evidence that these three Marines did make it all the way into Torsi. Uh, and if you walk the ground, you can easily see, that, that would be an easy thing to do. It's not far away from where the, their limit of advance was to we know how far they got and the guys like Hamilton and, and Jansen got, so probably. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little about the quality of the German opposition? And do you think that the quality of that force affected how we were able to adapt? Yep. Yep. Um, I think the, the first observation I make about the German defenders at Bella Wood uh, is that it was inconsistent. Okay, the, the 461st Regiment that was defending Bella Wood uh, was much better uh, and much more tenacious than the adjacent division, which I think was the 10th Division which was defending the town of Buresh. Uh, and there was actually a division boundary that went between the edge of Bella Wood 
um, and Barash. And the Germans actually raided their own divisions, um, fourth class, third class, second class, first class. The first class division was basically uh, could accomplish all of its mission essential tasks, including an attack. A fourth class division uh, was suitable only for the defense and not for offensive action. I think that division that was defending Barash was a fourth class division. But also there's the leadership aspect. Um, Bill Anderson, one of the battlefield guide, is working on a biography of the German commander of the 461st, a guy named Major Bischoff. He's an interesting guy in his own right. He fought in Africa, uh, leading native troops against the English down there in Africa for a while. He fought on the Russian front. Uh, he was actually awarded the Port La Marie, the Blue Max, uh, for his defense of Bella Wood. And he was involved in um, the German Civil War uh, Fry Corps fighting against communists in Germany post-war, uh, but was not a Nazi, and he didn't get involved in that movement. Uh, but anyway, Bischoff's leadership is incredible. His troops were sick. That influenza epidemic hit them while they were at Bella Wood, um, so they were a lot worse off physically. They had suffered a lot of casualties before they even got to Bella Wood, um, and really his iron leadership uh, really kept that unit together and made the defense of Bella Wood uh, probably last a lot longer. So that's, that's what I would say. Yes, sir. Well, were, they, were they Prussians? No, they were not. They, a lot of the Marine letters write home and said, oh, we, you know, we beat the Prussian Guard. They weren't um, Prussians. They were a reserve infantry regiment. Um, and I think they were Bavarians, but I'd have to look it up. Um, but they were not Prussians. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you touched upon it a little bit. You talked about kind of the, uh, the kind of the PR aspects of yep. what was in the news. Um, I mean, what were the kind of the initial questions that were being disseminated in the public versus how it changed over time? Well, it, it, World War One in general, the um, the Wilson administration controlled the press in a way that we would never tolerate today. So the only thing that got published was news that the U.S. government approved. That's, that's the fundamental bottom line you need to understand. But the press was kind of on board with this. The press saw their job as to support the war effort. So when they sent back stories, they didn't do uh, yellow journalism. They did bombastic, jingoistic, our boys are always brave, uh, our attacks are all successful, our generals are all brilliant. Um, and uh, that's the type of reporting that you got. Uh, from embedded reporters like Floyd Gibbons and all his compatriots. So uh, it was very much a partnership between uh, the press corps and military leadership. And that's all throughout the war. That did not change. Is there, is there anything after, like, you know, uh... Sure, there's a, there's a famous book called Now It Can Be Told. Uh, there was a, a, a very, very, um, I forget the author's name, but he was a wartime journalist in France the entire duration of the war before the U.S. got in and then went to the U.S. And the things that he wrote now can be told uh, were the things that he was prohibited from putting in the paper. And it's a fascinating read. It, there was a, um, a PBS documentary on World War I called The American Experience that was on recently. It's really, really, really good about the whole American experience of World War I. And they quote from his book quite a bit, and it's pretty graphic. Beyond uh, Thompson's uh, work uh, yep. that was recently released, any uh, thoughts on German perspective, either here or elsewhere, that are uh, of, of decent resource? And I, I can find very few. Yep. You know, post World War II, there are a great, uh, a great number of interviews with the German general staff, uh, senior mm -hmm. leaders, etc. I can find very little that is applicable to the uh, enemy's perspective. On that. Yeah, uh, there's. There's some authentic quotes by Germans um, from captured diaries, letters, things like that, where they talk about the U.S. Marines being terribly reckless fellows. They're, they're crazy, um, and they're very disciplined. They're madmen. They're great valor. Uh, sometimes in their after-action reports, which are in the Second Division archives and have been translated in English, they talk with grudging respect how they, particularly with life at Blankmont, the Marines are using fire and movement cunningly, uh, and you know it's like the only reason we had to give up our position was they very cunningly used the draws and the defilade around our position and, and things like that. They also criticized the Americans for attacking in dense mass formations and the machine guns were able to cut them down, things like that. Um, there seemed to be a German officer 
uh, style of writing that they taught at their military academies, which was very poly apologetic for any disasters and very bombastic in any achievement. So reading their official after action reports is kind of tedious, but uh, that's generally what you get. Um, I'll tell you what you don't get. I've got a backup slide I'm gonna go to. Uh, is this. So, um, so the legend says that the Germans called Marines Teufelhun because of their tenacious attacks at Bella Wood. This is an extract from a New York Times article on April 27, 1918. What it says at the bottom is uh, a letter from a Marine written from the first line trenches referred with a show of pride to a nickname which the Germans are said to have given the sea fighters. The name is Teufel, which means double dog. Sounds pretty authentic, right? Okay, so let's use a little bit of our critical thinking cap. Okay, in April 27, have the Marines really been in any significant combat yet? No. And what's the, um, okay, G2 guys, you have a human intel source, unvalidated, of previous unknown uh, confidence, and he happens to be a Marine recruiter. Um, how valid do you think this is? Uh, my own take on this is that the title Teufelhund was not given to the Marine Corps by the Germans, it was given to us by Recruiting Station New York. However, uh, what I will also point out is whoever came up with it, uh, the actual guys who earned it accepted this title of Teufelhund. Uh, they, they referred to themselves proudly as Teufelhund and they have passed this title on to us. Uh, and so it's absolutely an appropriate title and legacy of the First World War. Any further questions? So, so uh, let me just say, let me say thanks uh, to the wife and uh, to the museum for, for uh, supporting this. I know it's going to go a couple times. Um, I also want to thank uh, the folks in the three shop. So one of the things that we came in and we talked about is how to, uh, particularly in this type of assignment, um, you know, you try to catch yourself up on a couple of things. PME is one of those. Um, and so you kicked it off uh, great for us. Great. I found a great balance in history, uh, tactics, the human dimension, which I really like. Um, and it's a great opportunity for us to study that down here, the human dimension of warfare in this environment. Uh, I did write down, I don't know how to, if I have to quote you on there, is we, we are who we recruit. Um, so when I get on the road, that's very appropriate and I appreciate it. Um, and then the lessons learned. You know, if I was to carry on this discussion after a beer, is with all the folks that you, you mentioned up there going on to be uh, future battalion commanders, uh, future regimental commanders in future wars, how did they apply those lessons from World War I into those fights as opposed to today? So um, I appreciate it. Uh, just a small token uh, from oh, us. Cool. Uh, to you. Thanks and, very much. Uh, we hope it's well worth your time down here. It certainly worth it was for us. Joey, you, you and your team knocked it, out, not, knocked it out of the park for us to kick this and uh, keep it going for at least the next couple of years. So thanks. For how many folks are not from the depot who came down? Anybody? All right, fantastic. So I hope you hang around a little bit, um, ask some questions after, and then uh, if there's something we, that we can do for you uh, going forward, we appreciate it. So thanks. Thank you, for the same price you, if we run out. You can pick those things up off of Amazon in a quick turn. Uh, again, well worth the, the read, and especially so if you ever do plan to get over there and, uh, and walk around. Pete, again, thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Sir.